Hey, good evening, everyone. Marty Mazzura here, May 28, 2021. This is your weekly macro update. On your screen is our PWA macro index. We're going to talk about that for a minute, then I'll show you a handful of charts of key inputs that have either moved the needle a little bit this week or that I just want to update with you. Then we'll look at those uh, technical charts we've been looking at on tech stocks, on our Ag Futures ETF on the market overall, the S&P 500. And then I want to spend a little bit of time on the dollar this evening. So our index itself is, is still in a nice, nice uptrend. Uh, you can see here though, that this is actually our third week in a row where we've come, we've come down a bit. Um, actually we came down, oh, seven and a half points to 37 and a half uh, this last week. And we'll touch on where that's coming from. Um, again, you know, there's, there is strength in this economy. There's no doubt about it. I'm not bearish on the economy. It's certainly not based on the, on the surface data and on the ongoing, you know, impulse, if you will, for the government to throw a lot of money into this economy and for the Fed to basically finance the whole shebang. If, um, yes, that creates, um, all kinds of distortions. It continues to inflate debt bubbles and equity bubbles that really have our attention that we have to compensate for in our allocation of assets and how we hedge and so forth. But if you're looking for a recession to develop anytime soon, well, that's probably not in the cards. Although uh, you never know, which is why we do this week in and week out and record our the data, you know, score it for trend changes and so forth. So yeah, I, we shouldn't take too lightly the fact that we've had three down weeks in a row, but nothing to panic over at this point. Okay, so uh, personal income, we know this, right? Uh, stimulus check, come down from stimulus check, stimulus check, come down, stimulus check, huge come down here. Just these, you know, these big boosting incentives that really do nothing. They give you a short-term boost in consumption. Then you have to deal with the aftermath. I'll just get this out of the way. When central banks print $10 trillion and throw it into the global economy, and as we know, the lion's share of that here in the US, you are gonna get all kinds of strange and wonderful and not so wonderful things. That's where you're gonna get things like a meme cryptocurrency that was really meant as a joke. That would be Dogecoin having a, a market cap, if you will, of billions of dollars. No doubt sucking in a lot of people here, say, what, three weeks ago, and watching them lose a phenomenal amount of money as the thing has come down. A Bitcoin, which you can argue, certainly blockchain technology has a place. Uh, $63,000 a coin. I think this evening it's $36,000 a coin. And I know a lot of the proponents, some of them celebrities, some of them macro players who seem to have gotten themselves sucked into this, were thinking that thing was still in a strong, sustainable uptrend. You know, the smart ones would warn of big declines, but we've been warning at least clients and we haven't wanted to really just draw much attention to the blog on this topic because it's so charged with emotion and so on. But uh, many of you know privately and the ones who reached out after that, e that blog post where I said, if you want to hear my, my fuller take, let me know. There's many elements of it that trouble me. Uh, one is just simply the bubble nature of it and the fact that, you know, again, things are going to grow. Tumors, if you will, or flowers are going to grow when there's just so much liquidity forced in the economy and it's going to have to come out somewhere. You know, you can argue that the powers that be allowed the cryptocurrency or continue to allow it to be there as kind of a pressure valve on everything else. You know, at one point, not today, but at one point, you know, there was, I think, a couple trillion dollars of, of, and I'm using air quotes, value there that, you know, could have been, you know, a trillion or two pushing home prices higher, pushing the stock market higher and so forth. So, you know, you know, you, you might look at that and say, okay, well, at least it's there kind of diverting some capital away from where we already have bubbly asset prices. But at the end of the day, and China has, is sending that signal quite strongly. India is as well. U.S. central bankers are, are, are rumbling about it. The U.K. central banker, the bank president said, you know, if you own cryptocurrency, expect to lose your money. Anybody who thinks that they are sticking it to the system is just doesn't understand 
how powerful the system is and how the system can quash this stuff if the system decides that it wants to. Um, so anyway, I'll get off that. Consumer confidence. We touched on this this morning. The uh, University of Michigan's uh, survey came out today. Uh, it was down. It was uh, lower than ex expectations. You can see the Bloomberg Weekly Comfort Index looks like it might be lo rolling over a li little bit here, as does the conference board's consumer confidence indicator here as well. Like I said on the written blog, here we have the economy opening up. We've got 8 million job openings. We've got stock market at all-time highs. You wouldn't think you'd have the consumer rolling over, now would you? Um, so they have uh, high expectations for inflation. That's gone up. But low expectations, lowered expectations for their current uh, and uh, current situation and what they expect going forward. Um, so I'm going to show you a little more data here. But when you're looking at higher inflation and um, lower economic sentiment, you put those together and you start worrying about stagflation risk, right? Stagnation and inflation at the same time. Weekly jobless claims continue to improve nicely, 406, I think it was 466 last week. And then uh, continuing claims dropped to 3642 from 3794. So fewer people are losing their jobs, more people are going to work, as you would expect. You know, we're still seeing in all the surveys that intense frustration on the part of employers, you know, just enticing people to come back to work. And yes, we are beginning to see signs in many places that employers are raising the uh, the incentive. They're raising the proposed pay packages just to get people to come to work. Trust me, folks, wages are very, very sticky. They are tough to reduce once you raise them. That is inflationary on, a, on more than just a very short-term basis, no doubt about it. The Chicago Fed National Activity Index, this one troubles me a bit. Um, we actually have scored nicely the last time. It's 85 indicators. It's really an index inside of our index. And last month, um, 70 of those indicators were positive. So it was strongly positive. We saw a nice, nice move. It has pretty much rolled over. It's almost to zero. Uh, this, this week or this month, only 45 of the 85 inputs were actually positive. So almost half were, uh, were moved negatively and had a negative impact. Again, we have inflation rising. I'm going to illustrate that for you in a second. And we have um, conditions kind of showing some, some stress right here amid really early stages of the big, uh, the big opening up of the, of the economy. So uh, definitely things to pay attention to right here. The Economic Surprise Index. This is how are the data coming out relative to what economists projected previously. So what are the actual results relative to what economists' expectations are? And we're about back down to zero right here. And you can see, obviously, that you know, the economists were, were not thinking we were going to get that big bounce, or not to the extent we did. And, um, and boy, did the economy outperform economists' expectations. This, uh, this is concerning, obviously, uh, how wrong they can be in this direction. Uh, at this point in time is something, again, that we should be paying attention to. And I, I mean what I said going into it, though. These are, these are uh, trends. We're seeing slower rate of change, you know, in the positive data. Some of it is beginning to roll over. Um, but we are just beginning to open up. And I don't know that we've seen the big boost in the services sector yet that we're going to see, you know, in the vacation, you know, spending and all that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm not sitting here telling you it's a replay of August 2019 when we were certain that the economy was rolling over. Okay, so uh, inflation, the PCE, Personal Consumption Expenditures Inflation Index. So you get the year over year stuff, right? 3% is pretty hot inflation relative to what we're used to, but it's compared over a year ago when we were on lockdown. This is the one, though, folks, the uh, month on month is what we need to pay attention to. And that that's a big number. 0 0.66, call it 0 0.7. You know, on a monthly basis, that's you know, it's eight plus percent inflation. Right. The uh, headline consumer price index year over year up 4.2. That's that's a lot. Right. But again, um, base effects, you know, where we were last year. But 0.8. You know, again, what are we talking? 10% annualized inflation if we continue to grow at that rate. Now, we're not going to, frankly. We're gonna, some of these bottlenecks are going to open up. 
and inflation is going to come off the boil a bit. I told you that, that, that this great experience we've had in commodities, that that was due for a correction. Now, ironically, it, it came like within two days after video when I said it can come any day. And already, though, it looks like commodities are finding a floor. So it does look like there is a lot of bullishness. And that kind of like we've experienced with stocks, you know, we're starting to see some buying of the dip. I'm not short term very bullish on our commodities positions, uh, which are not small in our portfolio, because I do think, again, that bottlenecks will open up. Prices will begin to come down a bit. And all the people who say that folks like me who are concerned about longer term structural inflation simply don't know what we're talking about. And, um, and I get it and I, and I fully expect it. And that's fine. In fact, uh, when I no longer believe in longer term structural inflation, I'll be the first one to tell you that things have changed and evolved to the point where that's not the right thesis any longer. But to simply just focus on the bottlenecks and say that that 100% explains what's going on right here and not to pay attention to the really big, deeper, broader issues, right? The, the real contraction in globalization. The federal government wants to spend $6 trillion next year and the Fed wants to keep interest rates low. So the normal thermostat effect of higher interest rates, cooling inflation, that ain't gonna happen. This is the 1940s and we've talked about that analog on the blog and I'm sure we'll be talking about it again. But you know, it's it's 100 plus percent debt to GDP. We haven't had that since World War II. We had a war to recover from, so we had a tremendous amount of investment all over the world and created allies and created a big military presence. We became the protectors of the world to, to ward off the Soviets and all this great stuff. We, we allowed ourselves to have huge trade deficits so that we could send dollars into the world and make it the world reserve currency. We just pretty much owned the global order for a very long time. We are pulling away from that. And so the cheap labor set up, you know, that and then the ability to access technology in other places, it's still there. It's just not there like it was. Right. And but then we do have a war to fight. You know, the government does have the convenience of the war on climate change. Right. So in these budgets are just trillions of dollars over the next few years to create, you know, renewable energy capacity and so forth. So. Why are we in things like rare earth miners, uranium companies that mine copper? And, you know, there's more copper in an electric vehicle than there is in a combustion engine vehicle. Um, so you want to be in these commodity plays when trillions of dollars are going to be spent, you know, on climate change. But we've had a big run because, you know, this isn't news to anybody, right? So we think we're really gonna have to manage some risk, you know, along everything that we're doing. And we've done it in a broad way using S&P 500 puts for the most part. You know, we got real creative in 2019 with it, with an options caller. We do have a hedge now on ag. So Nick and I work every day on, you know, measuring risk reward. What do we need to hedge? What, are we, what can we go on hedged in? It, you know, we'll get more dynamic as we need to going forward and very close attention to upside opportunities as well as a downside risk. So speaking of commodities, here's your Bloomberg Commodity Index that we've been looking at for weeks now. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, we, we'll, we won't do this forever, I promise, but we've got these classic, you know, technical flag patterns. And then you have this one worked out pretty well. That's about the exact right price target. You go the length of the flagpole. Um, this one here though, stop short, but it sure looks like another flag pattern. And again, right in here, I said, any day we need to correct. I mean, that's just the shape you look for. And then, um, I, I wouldn't mind saying it consolidate for a little longer, but you can see this last week or so, it already looks like we're breaking out to the upside. If the flag patterns are going to continue, then, you know, a, a, a technician would put a new price target way up there. And expect you know some consolidation there we'll see interesting interesting to watch it's quite the lesson in technical analysis copper there's your flagpole right let's see how far it went wow perfect there's your price target just just exceeded it just barely and uh it's steep right here i don't know that i can draw a legitimate flag so wh whatever you want to call it we are uh, definitely consolidating in copper right here. But again, look at the bounce that we've had here recently. This is last week. But um, yeah, pretty pretty steep sell-off as you'd expect from such a steep rally as well. But we'll see. Is this going to play itself out and give us another big move? 
Yeah, I suspect it is. Could we go this far down before that happens? Oh, absolutely. Uh, commodities can be very volatile, but uh, unequivocally, in our view, at least right now, uh, this is a time to be patient and expect to own these things long term. So the Baltic Dry Index, the cost of shipping bulk goods across the world's ocean. You can see this was just insane and it is coming down. We're still at a very high level, but thankfully the cost of shipping has come down a bit here of late. So we'll see. We'll see if that's a new trend. Probably speaks more to getting more capacity online, perhaps, than it does any big slowdown. Okay, so let's uh, let's just update our, our charts here on these ETFs that we keep following. So here's that ag ETF. We watched it break through our trend line here, right? So we were kind of in a nice channel, if you will. Uh, I can do better. Yes, pulled off of that. But boy, what a, what a save right there on the 50-day moving average, which is beginning to slope back up. So just perfect. Just touched it and bounced like a spring. And then you're getting some... Uh, some improvement here in the MACD as well as momentum indicator and here in the RSI too. So, so yeah, this, this is looking more constructive. Tech uh, to me continues fundamentally to be a, to be a dangerous sector and it's a big, big component uh, of the S and P 500 kind of like financials were before, uh, before the financial disaster in 2008 and like tech was before the tech disaster in uh, you know 1999. But uh, I said here on the written blog when we lost this 50-day um, moving average and began to bounce off of that, I said the bulls are going to need to recapture that right there to feel comfortable. And sure enough, came back above the 50-day moving average and uh, is trying to hold that. So there's you know, quite the battle uh, happening right there right now. Um, you look here and you've got this good resistance right here, right? You had resistance, became support, and it's been resistance ever since. Um, I think I can take this um, this trend line and kind of tie this now to these three points here. Let me do that, right? So, um, so yeah, you get these two here and then this one. So, But you still have your upward sloping wedge. Again, you broke out of that here and trying like heck to recapture that, but we're still in that pattern. So that'll be interesting to track in the, in the weeks to come as well. Our uh, S&P 500 index, the volume indicator that I showed you last week, it's, uh, it's calmed down, or I should say it's kind of come back up here. We've seen volume pick back up. Remember I said uh, you could go broke shorting the market on this indicator, but it does tell us you know, that there is lack of conviction when this is going up and volume is coming down. But when we look at our kind of our traditional um, momentum indicators, we still have kind of like tech, we have that rising wedge. I could, let me do this here and just, yeah, I think we're still fighting to regain that trend line. You got, you know, the, the beginnings of a buy signal in here, although it's kind of, it looks pretty weak to me. You know, we're definitely consolidating off of these all-time highs right here. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be just something I'll probably keep you updated on. So the uh, the U.S. dollar index. So if there's one thing, uh, if there was just one chart to pay attention to, if we only had one, this is the one we'd want to pay attention to. These patterns work really, really well in currencies typically. I mean, right in here, we got bullish on the dollar short term. We had we had the falling wedge. We had the bullish divergences right here. Sure enough, we came out of it, had a pretty nice stretch, but then we were developing a rising wedge. And we did videos right in here. We had a rising wedge. We had a, a this would be bearish divergence because you couldn't make a new high here. Didn't really have it as much there, but we did anticipate rolling over. Then you lose the 50 day moving average. It rolls over. It becomes resistance. But right now, folks, what do we have? We have that bullish falling wedge. We did have a bullish divergence here on the RSI. Did not have it here on the MACD, but now we have just a nascent buy signal there. So, and we're breaking above that wedge. So I'm not, I, I'm not sitting here with a great deal of conviction that the dollar is going to bounce hard. Um, in fact, if it does, if, if I were trading the dollar short term, I would sell the rallies against the 50 day and against this resistance. Remember what I just said. I mean, we're, we're going to spend trillions upon trillions of dollars. The Fed is not going to let interest rates rise to any great degree in my, um, I'll, I'll say it, my humble opinion. And I could, I could be wrong. There are other people who have a different thesis, 
But if they are going to let rates rise, that means they're going to let debt bubbles pop. And I just don't see that happening. So if you don't let rates rise, you're not going to get the attractiveness of higher rates to the dollar. The dollar could rally on the prospects that stimulus are really going to boost the economy. But right now, as they're proposing stimulus, what are we seeing? We're seeing the indicators you know, get a little weaker. We're seeing sentiment come down and we're seeing inflation go up. Uh, boy, that's that's the recipe for gold if I've ever seen it. And if the dollar is, if this really is a legitimate move, the dollar does go much higher, folks, stocks are going to roll over. High probability that we'll see the dollar not much higher than it is currently, because that would be utterly problematic for all things that the powers that be are trying to accomplish. And folks, I uh, actually, I can leave it there. That's all the visuals I've prepared for you. I think I talked at you enough about what's happening in the world right now. Watch, watch the blog closely. Uh, I'll keep you up to date on the uh, short-term stuff on the morning notes. The uh, weekly main message is always more robust, and I get into other weeds with that. And I'll pop in additional times throughout the week and probably do a, a more thorough technical analysis for you soon and all the positions that we have. Hope you all a wonderful three-day weekend. And uh, if I don't uh, bug you at all over the weekend, I'll uh, be back at it Tuesday morning. Thanks as always for watching and listening. Take care.